our scripture lesson today, I, I first I also want to say to you how I choose my scripture. When I first, I don't get to preach very often, and when I first started, I kind of found myself going back to the same scriptures over and over and over again. And so I decided that whenever I did have the opportunity to preach, uh, bring the message, that um, I would use the liturgical calendar and um, there's a three-year cycle, and by the time you go through all three years, you pretty much get the whole Bible, you know, with Old New Testament Psalms. And uh, so I've chosen today the scripture from Luke 2, 22 through 40. And um, it's kind of a surprising little scripture. I, when I first read it, I thought, well, gosh, there's not much here, but there really is. So uh, as I read from the gospel, let's open our ears and our hearts and our minds to the word of God. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And then they were to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord in a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phineal, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> you <must> stand. <clears throat> Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, it's seated. I'd love to be able to preach like David where he gets out and he kind of walks around and he knows this whole sermon and doesn't falter at all. If I were to do that, I would get off on so many rabbit trails. We might be here until 1.30 or 2 o'clock. 
because I really do like to talk and I get sidetracked very easy. For that reason, I stick to my notes and I hope you'll understand. I want to tell you about my most favorite thing about Christmas and it comes every Christmas Eve. A very important and meaningful tradition for me has been the communion and candlelight service in the evening on Christmas Eve. I've attended that service every Christmas for as long as I can remember. As a little girl, our family always went to church for midnight service. We called it Midnight Mass. And then, after Ralph and I married, it was a priority for us. And then, as a family, as we added children to our nest, the service was always and is always inspiring and filled with the awe and the expectation of the Christ child coming to appear to us once more into our presence. Once again, God has come to us as Emmanuel. But for me, the most holy moment always comes as we leave the church. Out of, into the chilled night, some nights more chilly than others, with the traffic almost at a standstill, no one is out and about. It's still and quiet. And the bustle of preparation for Christmas Day is over. Walmart's closed, all the stores and restaurants are closed. It's quiet. The stillness of the night has set in. Folks are tucked away in their warm houses anticipating Christmas morning. But my anticipation is not for the morning, nor is it of a warm house or gifts that await or a great feast of traditional food the next day. My anticipation is always to step into the chill of the night, to look up into the dark night sky and gaze at the stars, trying to imagine what that holy night looked like so many, many years ago. I stand there by the car and I study the stars and I wonder which one was the one that the shepherds saw which star caught the attention of the wise men who realized that a king was born? Scripture doesn't describe what that star looked like. Was it a comet? An extra bright star? A planet passing by? A meteor? We really have no description of the star on Christmas night how bright it was, if it was set apart from others, was it really pointing down to the stable? We really don't know. What we do know is that the shepherds recognized that something wonderful had happened and the angel pointed them on their way. In our scripture today, we hear of Simeon and Anna who were a devout and holy man and a widowed prophetess in the temple. Mary and Joseph had traveled to the temple for the ceremony of purification for Mary and the dedication of their firstborn son, which happens about 40 days after the birth of a child. In this case, Jesus was the firstborn of Mary and Joseph, and he also was to be dedicated to the Lord to serve God his entire life. At the dedication, an animal, usually a lamb, is sacrificed, and then the Levite priests then step in and serve in the place of the firstborn males. But in Mary and Joseph's case, pigeons or doves were allowed to be substituted instead of the sacrificial lamb that was required. Because of the cost of the animals, Mary and Joseph couldn't afford to buy a sacrificial lamb. Little did the priests know that this child was the Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice right there in front of them. Pigeons and doves were permitted so that even the poorest of poor could dedicate their child. So for Jesus, the dove, which was the least expensive, was substituted as an offering. We also see in this that 
the Holy Spirit is the the symbol for the Holy Spirit is the dove. And so, or the Holy Spirit, yeah, I said that right. The dove is the symbol for the Holy Spirit. Well, it happens that the Luke scripture is the only gospel that mentions this particular event of purification and dedication. In the other gospels, the couple and Jesus are right off to Egypt to escape King Herod and his order to kill all of the babies under two years old. I don't believe that the wise men had even shown up yet to see Jesus before they went to the temple. Well, let's get back to the temple because I did one of my little rabbit trails. The ceremony here was twofold. First, it was to purify Mary after childbirth. And then second, to dedicate their firstborn to a life of service to God. Well, we know that that was going to happen anyway, that Jesus was the Son of God and had come to serve. So this little story tucked into the Luke narrative may seem unnecessary, but in truth it carries great significance. You see, Simeon was a godly man. He'd been praying and waiting for years for the Messiah to appear. The Holy Spirit was on him, and that was way before any of us understood the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would not die before he saw the Lord's Messiah. So the day came that Mary Joseph and baby Jesus made their way to the temple for the purification and dedication service. And at the very same time, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit moved Simeon to enter the temple. As they came together in the great hall, Simeon walked up to Mary and took the baby out of her arms. He praised God and said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Simeon had just pronounced that that baby, this baby, was the awaited Messiah and that salvation was not only for the people of Israel but for the Gentiles as well. Yet another confirmation that this baby is the Lord come to flesh to live with us. It's interesting to note that Jesus was not revealed to the priests or to the priests that was doing the ceremony, for they as a class at this time were corrupt and unspiritual. So God intentionally passed the priests and chose Simeon and Anna to be the recipients of the good news through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph and Mary marveled <clears throat> at what was said, and then Simeon blessed them all and continued on to prophecy that this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be spoken against. Many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will not only pierce his soul, but it will pierce theirs as well. This was the first hint in Scripture of the work and the suffering that Jesus had ahead of him. At that moment, Anna, a prophet, prophetess, came in. She was very old. She had lived in the temple for many, many years after the death of her husband. With no family to provide for her, she was allowed to move in permanently and live there. She was 84 years old. Once she moved into the temple, she never left. She didn't need to. God provided a place for her to sleep, food for her to eat and the opportunity for her to have a safe place. She spent her time day and night praying, fasting, and worshiping God. With the word of God and the promise of the Messiah that the Holy Spirit placed inside of her, she also lived in the expectation of the coming of the Savior of Israel. When she came into the room where Simeon was with the baby, 
she recognized him as the Messiah immediately and spoke to all of the people that were standing around her about this child and who he was. Here we have two people, both godly and faithful in serving the Lord, both awaiting the Messiah. Two eyewitnesses to whom this child is and that they are not afraid to tell the people about it. Simeon, in fact, was so excited and blessed that he even told God it was okay for him to die now since he had seen for himself this coming Messiah that he had waited so many years for. I've pondered this scripture for several months. I knew in early November that I was going to be speaking today, and um, I looked at the lectionary reading, and so I read the reading and really just kind of thought and thought and thought, what, it, what does this message bring to us? What is there here for us to hear? But my first question really was, how did Simeon and Anna know without a doubt that this tiny baby was the Messiah? Did the baby glow? Did it have a little, one of those little cross and sunshine things over its head that we see maybe in the Catholic or the Orthodox Church? What, what gave this baby away? How did they know? It does seem to be a mystery. However, if we look at Simeon and Anna, we know that first they both had hope, unfailing hope, that the coming of the Messiah would happen during their lifetime and that they'd been promised to see this prophecy fulfilled before they died. Their hope in the fulfillment of the promise was unwavering. Secondly, their faith was great. Not just faith, but a total faith in the God that promised the Savior of the world. I think I said earlier that the Holy Spirit was upon these two people. The Holy Spirit called them both into the temple at the same time with gentle nudges in order to encounter this Christ child. How did their old eyes see this baby? But it wasn't just their eyes that saw this sweet newborn. It was the spirit of God within them that witnessed to their spirits that this indeed was the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Now Simeon and Anna were both at peace with themselves. They had witnessed for themselves the Savior, the Christ, the redemption of the world. My next question was, and is, can we also see the Christ? We've experienced the rebirth of Jesus again this last week. What did Simeon and Anna have? They had faith in God. They had hope of a savior to come. They prayed a lot. They fellowshiped with other believers and they fasted in order to be able to hear God speak. They had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I say to you, can our faith languish and die when we have before us Christ, not as a helpless child, but as the Redeemer who has made atonement for sin and has ascended to the right hand of God? When we have before us his divine teaching and holy life, and all the influence which he has exercised upon human society for the last 2,000 years. Can we recognize the Savior? With the Holy Spirit indwelling in us, the answer is a resounding yes. I want to go back to the starry night, the dark sky with all the shining lights, you know, in our lives, there are many, many lights that shine at us, trying to get our attention and to draw us this way and that way. Just as there were in the night sky so many years ago, those lights beckon us to come, to go, to see Christ.
but with all the extras pulling at us. My question for you is, what star might you be following? My prayer for you is that you are following the light of the world, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.